little bit about the talk, but first, um, it's a rather unusual set of authors. You'll notice uh, it's, uh, the point here is not rhetorical. Uh, this, this paper uh, grows out of a project that uh, Seren and I have been working on for a while now. Uh, it specifically gives material that's going into a chapter in a book that he's got coming out uh, on uh, technology and social media, things of that sort, in which he invited us, um, our colleagues, to read the other chapters and then reflect upon their, their ethical dimension. Um, so this actually is, in a very real sense, a collaboration, and so it is improper for me to put my name there. Rather, I want you to know that this is among Georgetown University. There are several of us. Uh, I'll move on to there. Um, I, I sort of lead the team, and I'll give you more about what I do in a minute. But in addition, uh, I have uh, two friends who have two PhDs. I don't know what possessed them, but Rochelle has one in statistics and also in cognitive science. And Kevin, who's a Jesuit, so he doesn't have you know, all the accoutrements that get in the way of life for the, the rest of us, he has a PhD in, in genetics and in, in ethics, uh, which is very helpful in this project. And uh, We've been working together for a long, long time. And Julie is our research assistant and soon to be a medical student. Uh, now with Stevens, uh, how in the world did Georgetown and Stevens ever get together? Well, Georgetown is known for a few things. Uh, we're very well known, of course, for our School of Foreign Service. We also have a good medical school, a very fine law school. We do not have an engineering school. We do not have a school of public health. And so if Georgetown, as an institution, is to continue to make the kind of research impact and wants to, then we have to reach out to institutions that have skills, disciplines, capabilities that we don't have. And so Stevens is kind of our mirror image, if you will. Uh, they do have a College of Arts and Sciences, of course, because even engineers have to learn how to write and read and so forth. Uh, but they don't have a School of Foreign Service. Uh, they don't have a medical school. They don't have a law school. So, and on top of all that, and this is what really matters from the sociological point of view, uh, my boss, the Senior Vice President for Research, Spiros Dimolitsis, is close friend with all the Greeks that run Stevens. And that, that really is the fundamental uh, critical connection. Uh, but so Michael, Greg, Andy, and Lisa. Lisa happens to be the dean of the College of Arts and Science. And Michael's a, a bona fide philosopher. Uh, Greg and Andrew are both historians. So we have an anthropologist, a cognitive scientist, an ethicist and geneticist, a philosopher, two historians, and Lisa is a, is a philosopher and historian of, of, uh, of, of physics. And then we have Soren and Duff. Now, that's many institutions, many disciplines. This is the modern face of research, I think. This is what it's going to take this kind of collaboration is what it's going to take to make, uh, to help us solve the really hard problems. At Georgetown, we think of our mission as helping to solve the hard problems in human security, health, and sustainability. And we know we can't do it alone, so we partner with people like this to get the job done. But Georgetown doesn't do anything without thinking about the ethical dimension. And so that's the, the origin of this, quite frankly. Now, we've done a few things together and we're continuing to work. We, we see our output as part and parcel of developing the relationship. Um, there's a long story, but we're in the process of organizing and putting on a conference for the National Science Foundation on privacy in uh, big data. And the, the premise of this conference is we have identified and reached out to a whole parcel of uh, NSF-funded investigators in the building capability and community uh, in big data program and also in the directorate of education health and human resources all these people are dealing with big data all of them have had issues with privacy we're bringing them to georgetown together to think about um, gather data about reflect upon uh, the the issues that they're facing with respect to privacy and big data and we're going to codify this 
Uh, what we've been doing is writing a white paper, if you will, that we're going to send to all these people once the funding comes, and you'll hear you'll hear the results of that today. Um, and then and and <clears throat> so so that white paper will go out. But then, as part of um, uh, Soren's book, uh, we took the same uh, privacy matrix that I'll talk to you about in a second and applied it to some of the chapters in the book. And so now that becomes a chapter which presents the, white pa the result of the pa uh, collaborative privacy matrix work and the analysis of, of the book. And we're starting another, uh, another book project uh, on the ethics of big data. So this is not a one-off project. It's not Jeff Coleman's project. It's an inter-university project, interdisciplinary project, ongoing, uh, hopefully long-term relationship in which Purdue, Georgetown, Stevens, and many others uh, provoke uh, and, and, and sustain a, a, a discussion about these issues of the privacy and ethics of big data as it unfolds as a discipline, right here at the very beginning. So that's what this is really all about. That's the big, the big picture. So what I want to talk to you about today specifically then is first the context of my work, which is building big data at Georgetown. Then I'm going to go directly into the uh, actual subject matter. I want to talk about contextualizing the meaning, the meaning of privacy. Our key point here is that you know, we use the word privacy as if it had one single unambiguous meaning. And the fundamental point here is that that is not a fair assumption. And that to the extent that we think of it as a simple, unambiguous concept, we are actually not doing it justice. And throwing it around loosely um, will not serve big data, it will not serve uh, the people who use big data, and it will certainly not serve the people about whom the big data speaks. So we're, we're, we're looking for how can we think about privacy in a more nuanced, contextualized way. And then um, I want to talk about a, a favorite theme of mine over the years, which is uh, how um, values get embedded in technology of any kind. I started this line of work uh, when biotechnology broke out in the, in the 1980s, after I came back from Australia, and I pursued it through uh, the analysis of the electronic health record and issues of privacy and security in that, and now bring this to, to big data. There's, there's a very fundamental sense in which either explicitly or implicitly, when we build these big technologies, we embed them with values. And the proposition here is that we should do that in a very articulate, explicit fashion. And that to the extent that we do that, the technology serves our interests better. Okay, a little bit about the context of my work. Um, I'm an anthropologist and I work, I'm in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology because for many years I taught a course in the, in the bureaucracy of biodefense. It's another whole story, but that's how I got into big data business. Um, uh, but uh, about two or three years ago, the, uh, uh, the um, senior vice president for research decided that he wanted to create a large-scale project at Georgetown that, uh, uh, that dealt with what he calls socio-technical problems. And he wanted it to revolve around two poles. One pole is this picture which is a computer architecture of a specific sort. And those of you that are computer scientists probably can simply look at the picture and understand it better than I do. I know Peter was uh, explaining my own program to me better uh, today than I understood it myself in that respect. But the other side is what good is an architecture if it's not being used uh, to deal with the kinds of problems of human uh, security and so forth that I mentioned earlier. Well, that's where the anthropologist comes in. So I'm sort of the use case guy, if you will. Now this architecture is a rather different perspective on big data. Often, and you know, we can spend all day about definitions, but a common conception of big data is that we take data from a million different places and chunk it all into a great big archive. And we spend millions of dollars trying to get the format right, the plumbing right, et cetera, and so forth and so on. Well, this architecture sort of says, well, you can do that if you want, but there's another way. And the other way is to leave all that data where it is, 
but build tunnels or, ch or channels or, or connectors to it and represent that data. Don't bring it anywhere, but represent it when you need it across a huge hypergraph. And then by running various kinds of uh, algorithms, uh, which you all are very adept at developing, uh, it, it, this data, which is dispersed over the entire world, becomes available for visualization uh, by people who are authorized to see it. So in essence, although it looks like a thing, it's not. It's this down here is a whole bunch of any kind of a, any imaginable data source that you want. And I'll talk about the big data source we have at Georgetown in a minute. This is uh, links these various data sources individually to this hypergraph. And each of these little pins uh, represent uh, nodes and edges, which is a term I didn't understand before I came into this but all of you will understand it better, and then makes it available through various means for, for potential users. So we are building this architecture, and we are focusing on uh, use cases um, that are appropriate for this sort of thing, because this, it turns out that this is a knowledge base, and that the little nodes and the edges between them represent people. We've chosen to, to represent all the people in the world, so when this thing is fully built, it will, there will be seven some million entities, statistical people. The Oak Ridge Land Scan database is a foundational source of information for this. Other public databases are. Uh, so that is the whole world in some sense. Um, and so the question becomes, if you have that sort of um, architecture, what are, what are the right kind of problems to think about? And I'll come to that in a second. Now this term EOS, who knows uh, what, which god, which goddess is EOS? Anybody? We all had to look it up. Um, it's the, that's right, it's the goddess of the dawn, Greek goddess of the dawn and of wisdom it turns out, which is kind of fortuitous. The problem is this, uh, this huge archive was initially built as part of what we call Project Argus which was a, a global biosurveillance project built during the time of bird flu uh, in order to provide a, uh, an indirect and remote way of monitoring the movement of bird flu across the face of the earth. What we were looking for was the moment that bird flu became mutated and became human to human transmissible, which of course fortunately it never did because it was very lethal and it, was, it had people on edge the same way Ebola has people on edge today. But the key to this thing was a, a basic anthropological kind of framework in which uh, the, the, the core proposition was that people have routines, but threats like infectious diseases or war or other kinds of threats disrupt those routines and then people talk about it, report it, it gets reported in local media and then percolates up so that if you wanted to create a remote monitoring process. If you tie yourself to local media, you might be able to see that moment when uh, bird flu became human-to-human uh, uh, -human transmissible. The key to it was the idea that people's social behavior would change, and that if you understood the way people live normally, you'd be able to interpret those changes through reading local media. So what that's led to is an archive of over 700 million articles from 22,000 sources in 46 languages. This is big data of a really different kind. This is the very opposite of genomic data. Genomic data is quantitative, highly structured, well curated. This is completely the opposite. This is totally qualitative, unstructured, uncurated. It represents a massive resource, possibly. For some problems, maybe. It was very good for biosurveillance. It worked well for what it was designed for. But it's more, potentially more useful because we didn't just collect articles that were about biosurveillance or, the, or because we were worried about social changes, we collected every article in every journal for every day, and we still do so. so it's like having every newspaper available to you for the last you know, 15 years uh, in the world. So we did not, uh, do not and did not collect uh, in the US, but we will. 
Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you'll, you'll go back to the, uh, the red layer is what we call the data sources. And so this EOS represents a major, um, a major source for, for this architecture we call Avastera. And it's really a major resource for researchers who are interested in uh, this kind of data as a supplement to whatever other kinds of data that they have. And our proposition there is that some of these hard problems, like take Ebola, uh, require integrating or synthesizing together uh, quantitative, structured, curated data with qualitative, unstructured, uncurated data, that if you want to understand these kinds of phenomena in their fullness, you have to bring all these things together. So you have interdisciplinary work among experts, you have different kinds of data being brought together from all over the world, and that's what this is all about. Okay, the hypergraph, as I mentioned, is basically people and entities that you can build up from people, families, organizations, nation states, cities, and so forth. And so, in essence, it's a kind of map of the world, of the globe's population. Well, that creates some interesting issues, one of which is, of course, pertinent today. Uh, anybody who uh, uh, gets a sense of what this is about is immediately going to ask about privacy. And so, uh, Jay, the computer scientist, Jay Smart, what do you suppose Jay Smart's Georgetown email address is? Smart at Georgetown. <laughs> now, how did he do that? I don't know. He got the only one like it. Pretty good. Anyway, so he has developed an approach to uh, what he calls a privacy appliance that is very pertinent here. And there are a number of um, elements that matter uh, and can kick off our discussion of privacy. First element is you'll see that these represent a whole range of organizations that are uh, linked to the hypergraph uh, through that blue layer who've agreed to participate and whose data is pertinent to some problem. Um, notice the data stays here. This policy body manages the kinds of research that's done, the kinds of patterns, the kinds of graphs, the kinds of data that will come in, and the kind of results that are going to come out. For every problem, there is a policy body. In real life terms right now, and I'll, I'll show you this in a minute, the uh, departments of health of the uh, states of Maryland, D.C., and uh, Virginia are working with us on HIV data using this kind of technology. The, the matching uh, pattern is here. Uh, the uh, transforms of the data go in here. Out come the answers. The data disappears. Uh, and this data, I mean, rather the transformed information disappears. But, but this never moves. So that's the, a, a core concept. We are operationalizing this in a preliminary way in a pilot study we're doing with, uh, on HIV. Uh, interestingly enough, in the DC area, we have a very high prevalence of HIV, 3% in the region as a whole, which is very high. Um, and uh, the odd thing is that people live in these different communities, Maryland, Virginia, and DC, but they don't always get their care there. So I, my, I live in D.C., for example, but my doctor's office is actually in Maryland. So if I were just, you know, diagnosed uh, with HIV uh, and I went and got care in Maryland, as far as D.C. knows, I'm, I'm out of care. They don't know that I'm getting care in Maryland. It's a very tedious manual process to try to discover that. So the basic idea of this project is to essentially figure out uh, where the patients are, where the people with HIV are so that you can know who's in care, who's not in care, and try to find the people that are in care to get them back in care. Because as I'm sure you all know, the, the modern idea of treatment as prevention in HIV is you've got to get people on antiretroviral therapy so that their viral load gets down, but if they're not in care, if they're not being uh, monitored and su supported, that won't happen. So it's very critical. This is a fundamental public health question, and it needs to take instance a minute, seconds, not six months to a year, to find out that Jeff has been diagnosed and is now getting care across the street in Maryland. That needs to happen immediately. So that's what this pilot is all about. 
It's an application both of the privacy technology and also of the utility of this kind of information sharing. That's what this amounts to. This is a, a, a technology for private information sharing with a very, very all the data is uh, personally identifiable in this particular uh, process. So it makes it a good test in that respect. Whoops. Let's see where. Oh, yeah, that is the nice one. Okay, just to wrap up. Um, so this is the, the visualization layer, if you will. If the first slide I showed you uh, of, of, of the EOS archive was of the red layer, and the slide I just got through with discussing privacy assurance was actually the hypergraph layer. This is an example of the visualization process which shows some preliminary results uh, on work we're doing in forced migration. This is hardcore anthropology <coughs> uh, and, um, and history, among other things. You'll see up here this concept of dread threat. Some of you may be aware of this theory about uh, the way ordinary people like you and me uh, perceive and evaluate technological threats as opposed to the way scientists do, the kinds of values that go into that. Um, I took uh, the, that basic theory and asked myself two questions. One, can we discover this out in the ethnographic literature rather than just in social psychological surveys, and can we track it over time? And in, a, in some case studies, the answer to both those questions is yes. So what we've done in this particular case is apply the theory to Somalia, uh, as, and all of you know uh, what an interesting place Somalia is, and this particular uh, part of the study is the 2006-2008 period when Al-Shabaab first was emerging in uh, Somalia and the Ethiopians invent, in, invaded. And this is um, uh, an assessment of what was going on in Mogadishu. So the dread threat level uh, was climbing and uh, it was a mixture of threats but the main one was, was violence. And then what this pretty picture represents is the mix of strategies that people used over time to deal with that threat. And, and you'll see here that these are their uh, the, the range of choices. Exploit current opportunities, stand up self-defense, pursue alternative livelihoods, migrate, flee, collect relief. And you can see that as the threat threat um, uh, changes over time, that what people are doing to deal with it is changing over time too. The mix of threat of, of, of responses is changing. And it's this combination of dread threat with response that we call, over time, that we call menacing context. So, what does this represent? Well, we have this advanced computer architecture. We have large scale qualitative databases. We have anthropologists, historians, and computational modelers and ontologists working together uh, to visualize in a dynamic way, a situation like Somalia on the ground. And that's what this is an artifact that it, it represents that possibility. Now, this same sort of thing in various formats, uh, we're repeating at Georgetown uh, in these main areas. Uh, these areas seem different, but what they all have in common is several things. One, they're all problems of globalization, the increased interdependence of the world. Two, in spite of the fact that they're global phenomenon, they all manifest significant local variations. So from the anthropological perspective, this is intrinsically and deeply comparative. And it's using big data and access to big data to accomplish that comparative uh, assessment. Uh, there are people uh, either at Georgetown or with our partners who are uh, world leading scholars in all of these areas, and we have access to uh, large data sets uh, for, for each of these. So th those represent the, the core of our program around which we are building this whole thing. So there are technological and anthropological, if you will, uh, dimensions to it. So are there any questions about that? That's, it's, it's in building that pro program that I, I came to know Sarin through the NSF process of grant writing and so forth. And, and that's why it's important because even though Georgetown is not an engineering school, by partnering with people who are, 
we're in a position to launch these kinds of projects and get them funded and collaborate with people like you in doing them. Any other, any questions about that? Okay, so let's now talk about why you really came, uh, which is uh, the issue of privacy. So, um, over the summer, uh, in the spring and the summer, um, we have Friday calls. We, ca we call them our um, NSF privacy, uh, privacy conference calls. And over the summer, we developed, uh, uh, as a group, uh, this privacy matrix. So this matrix itself is the first and most fundamental artifact of our collaboration. It began with Soren's uh, comment uh, that privacy exists at different levels, in different contexts, and in different communities, and that the meaning of it varies depending upon those communities or contexts. So if you will, that's the, that's the top here. On the other hand, Michael uh, Steinman, our philosopher, said, well, yes, that's, that's true. But it's also true that the, that the significance of privacy varies depending upon the ethical principles um, that it's paired with. So you're interested, if you will, in how a, a breach of privacy in big data might actually harm somebody how it might lead to some kind of social injustice or social inequality, how it might compromise the autonomy of persons or communities, and how it might undermine uh, or protection, protecting the privacy of big data might support trust in some organization. So if you put those two things together, you get a matrix in which you can systematically locate various kinds of circumstances and say, okay, well, here we have, uh, I know many of you all work on social media in, this, in, the, in the virtual community space. So instead of just worrying simply, if you will, about privacy in social media, this matrix suggests that a complete analysis of privacy in social media invites you to look at the consequences for doing real harm, the consequences of, uh, for social inequality and justice, autonomy and trust. So there's that inquiry there. It guides you rather systematically through the kinds of issues, ethical issues pertaining to privacy, uh, in these different contexts with respect to these different ethical principles. So this, this privacy matrix is at the heart of the white paper that we will be sending out uh, to the participants in the conference when it happens. Some of these... Um, I mean, there are examples of, of, of many of these already. Um, in, the, in, the, in the column labeled individuals, uh, profiling is, a, is a, big, a big deal. Now, you'll notice immediately that the, the profiling of people because of some characteristic is, is not just an individual problem, but it's also a problem in social justice, potentially. It could be a problem in non-maleficence. So if we go back to that matrix, you can see that that problem of profiling might find itself here or here or elsewhere. In our uh, research, we've discovered, and I'm sure you all are familiar with these cases where tweet, uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, data has been reused and allegedly misused, acquired for one purpose, used for another, which is a common problem. Uh, so, so that's an issue that's out there in the, in the uh, research community. How do you use data that sometimes is personally identifiable, often personally identifiable, for research purposes when that purpose was never imagined at the time the data was created and the people that you're doing research on cannot say that they want to be part of it or not? How do we deal with that in the research setting? That's an interesting and challenging issue that we all face. Sale of big data in commercial context, we don't need to belabor that one. Protecting vulnerable populations in educational contexts. You've probably heard about this. A couple of these uh, online uh, educational companies uh, sort of gather every click, if you will, of these of children. 
and they get information about Social Security and a whole bunch of different issues like this, and they run into problems when the parents have discovered uh, that this is going on, and the parents were never consulted about whether the kids could be part of this. The children certainly weren't consulted. Um, the whole ordinary set of human subject protections that uh, we have come to expect in the research community are completely sidestepped. Um, so here, data is collected without consent, without knowledge, and used for purposes that are completely beyond the control of the people about whom the data is being collected. That's a whole host of questions that we need to deal with. Controlling access to big data and scientific research. This was one of the more bizarre, um, I guess, findings that uh, some people are worried that Purdue is going to monopolize all Twitter data and that Georgetown will never get it. Therefore, the students and professors at Purdue, I'm just, of course, being hypothetical there, will have a great advantage over students and professors at Georgetown because you have access to Twitter and Facebook and we don't. So there's people that are worried about that. This question of controlling access to big data in science, however, goes deeper than that. In some of my own writings about genomic data and indigenous people, the question of who owns the data is at the heart of the issue. And if you talk to many indigenous communities around this country, in Canada, and in Australia, you will find that their attitude is, it's our data. We let you collect it. You may even store it for us. But it's our data. And if we want you to destroy it, and the last thing on earth you're going to do is use it for something other than what we've cleared. And, and people have gotten in trouble over this one. Um, this is a very interesting and very important case where you have to think, uh, I mean, in some cases, as in, like with the Navajo, they have a, uh, their own IRB. They have a 12-step process, which I think is really clever, you know, trying to wean scientists off their addiction for, for big data. It's really, I, I thought it was extremely clever when I came across it, like the 12 steps, you know, I'm out of control and all this kind of thing. Uh, it's very rigorous, man. I mean, you've got to go through these 12 steps, and by the end of it, you've signed over all your rights. You get access to the data. You can only use it for what you uh, say you're going to use it for. And if you want to use it for something else, you have to go back to them and ask all over again, go through the same 12 steps. Very rigorous, very serious business. The notion is they own the data, period. Okay? Big data and government surveillance. <clears throat> Have you all ever heard of the Terrorist Information Awareness Program? Back in the, at the beginning, uh, when we were starting Project Argus, uh, it was all over the Washington papers. Uh, uh, John Poindexter and DARPA uh, were in the post 9-11 world seeking to gather, find the needle in the haystack was the phrase. The other phrase is connect the dots. Well, to find the needle in the haystack and connect the dots, you have to amass all of this all of this data about individuals, and then sort through it. And it hit the, hit the post, it was a big deal, big huge controversy, probably the biggest stink um, in a series of stinks. There was that one and the phone monitoring, you know, it's sort of every five years or so, issues like this come up. Um, and again, th this, one, this one was very important for us when we created Project Argus, because we did not want to have Georgetown on the upper left-hand corner front page of the Washington Post for privacy violations. Just not an option, not a good thing for us. So this case we learned a great deal from and it affected profoundly the way we did business. Okay, uh, a little bit about defining privacy. <clears throat> and uh, I started by, by suggesting that privacy is contextually, must be contextually understood. The more positive way of saying that is that there's no single meaning to privacy. Rather, it depends on context and other ethical values for its value and its import. And it varies dynamically over time. And as this, this shift between public and private uh, uh, changes with, with time and with context. So what that means is although we tend to use the word privacy as if we all knew what it means, and in specific instances, we do know what it means. There's a whole family of meanings. Uh, you've all probably taken Philosophy 101, and you know about Wittgenstein's theory of a family of meanings. This is an example where 
The word refers to multiple concepts, all of which are specific, but not necessarily the same. Hence, the emphasis that we place in the mat matrix on individual, virtual community, commercial, education, science, and government. These are the contexts, and we suggest this provides guidance for uh, a more nuanced approach uh, to privacy. So let's look at the implications with respect to the various principles uh, that we look at. Uh, Non-maleficence, it's a fancy word. It means essentially do no harm. So with respect to big data, a, a core principle is do no, harm, do, do no direct harm with big data activities. <clears throat> that's not, uh, that's not uh, totally transparent. Uh, it requires analysis. Um, justice, um, a, a distribution of opportunities, rights, benefits, and harms as a result of big data activities. We want to ask ourselves, okay, if we're going to do this, will this Will this application and use of big data uh, make the world a, a more just place or make the world a, a less just place? And so forth. Autonomy, trust, and beneficence. Uh, in the literature, the, the term maleficence and beneficence, they're sort of opposites, and sometimes each subsumes the other. Uh, but beneficence is more the idea that you have to go out and do good in this world, um, and so forth. So, so, so what we have then is these various contexts across the top and these various uh, principles down the bottom. A special note on autonomy. Um, one of the big concerns that people have is that the manipulation of big data and the solving of problems uh, with big data that occurs, if you will, behind the scenes compromises individuals at their at their, at their own level, and then compromises something about the community as a whole. Um, and so the issue of autonomy is a principle that enables us to understand the generalized impact of big data in, in, in the social fabric of life. Uh, our society, at least, is, is built upon the premise that we live and die to support autonomy of individuals, families, and communities. This is a core element of our society. So the question of how big data affects that at the level of individual decision making and at the level of community decision making uh, matters quite a lot. Okay, so that's sort of the, 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 the framework that we've, we've, we've developed. Now, the, now the, the idea here is uh, you can take that framework and take particular situations, particular um, uh, applications of big data, and, and inquire um, using the matrix into the uh, contextual and ethical principle dimensions of, of a particular case. So what I've done in the, ch in the chapter for, for Sorin's book is, is take some of the other chapters in the book and use the matrix in that way. Um, and at the heart of this is this notion that as we um, enable big data, and, and by that I mean all the activities that we do to collect it, to analyze it, the tools that we build, and all of the kinds of activities that we engage in to make big data possible, we the designers, users, and analyzers embed and realize values in the big data tools that we build. This is a, a core proposition of the analysis. And, I, and I, I say there are three specific ways that we can understand that. One, values guide the way we use the tools. And this is a very common and well understood uh, phenomenon. We, you know, codes of ethics, very uh, rules and regulations about privacy in a particular uh, context like the health, electronic health record, these are all represent values that help guide uh, the use of big data tools. But big data tools may go further. They may help individuals and communities realize values, bring them into being. And this is a very positive thing, of course. And then finally, the third part, Enabling tools to realize values, in other words, designing tools so that they help bring into being the values that we, that, we, uh, that we are seeking, sometimes means that we have to actually use those values to create the tools in the first place. 
So they become deeply embedded in that sense. And this is a room full of people who either do or will design tools. And you either do or will become familiar with the concept of performance requirements. And in a very practical way, the performance requirements may link instrumental and substantive values uh, through the effective design and functioning of big data technology. Now, by instrumental uh, values, I mean uh, you design a tool, you design a hammer, the hammer is designed to uh, knock nails into a, into a, um, into a, um, a board. But the board itself helps build a house that provides shelter. And the provision of shelter is a substantive value. So there's both elements. When you're designing an effective hammer, you're thinking about both instrumental and substantive values. So from the perspective of big data then, we can see that values condition tools help bring them into being, and tools help realize values in a dynamic, interdependent, embedding process. That's what I mean by embedding. It's this production, design, production, and use of tools in light of the values that guide them, that they help realize, and that help design them. So how does that apply to the, to the book? Well, I'm gonna take some examples out of the book um, and show you. So one of the chapters uh, is a good illustration of where, val where explicit statements about, for example, privacy values need to be articulated for the tool to be well used. In this instance, what we have is a, a tool that is designed to enhance meeting performance. How many of you attend meetings as part of your work? Anybody not? No. Okay. So what this tool does is it essentially video, it, well, it, it listens, it watches, it records all the overt activities in a room. And then it analyzes those and it gives you a sense of who's participating and in what way, who came in late. Anybody ever come in late for a meeting? Yeah, well, now you'll be caught, okay. And, and the idea there, of course, is, is very straightforward. We spend a lot of time in meetings, it's expensive time, we want to make best use of it. Nothing wrong with that. But there are some issues here that we might want to think about, and we might want to think about rules to help guide the use of this tool in practice. And the values specifically I want to identify are autonomy and non-maleficent. Anybody who's familiar with uh, uh, the literature on prisons, for example, will be familiar with the notion of the panopticon. It's, uh, it's a, a way of seeing everything that goes on in a prison all the time. And when I read this chapter, I said, well, here's a, a big data version of, of the panopticon, because it's looking at us all the time in all the meetings that we go to. And that's a very interesting and always troubling prospect. Now, from a sociological view, if you will, uh, this, data, uh, this data recording device, this is creating big data, privileges a certain kind of, of activity over another. It concerned overt, observable behavior. How many of you only move in a meeting? Do any of you think in a meeting? Do any of you do meeting business elsewhere, offline? Do any of you stay quiet in meetings when your boss is there and you don't want to make a fool of yourself? So this is an interesting one because it says certain kinds of overt behavior are better are, are, are measures of meeting performance. And that, that's an interesting one. If that were to be used unambiguously as a measure of meeting performance, effectiveness and more to the point individual performance it could have serious consequences for the people in the meeting now here's an instance in which the tool could be used but I would suggest that it would need to be used with care and under rather strict 
guidelines about what happens to the data, who sees it, and for what purpose is it used. All right, now realizing values on a more uh, affirmative note. <clears throat> there's this uh, really interesting chapter, and for me, it's a, a real challenge because it's hardcore uh, computer science. Uh, it's a, it's a, I, I'm extremely interested in, in what it had to say uh, given the architecture that I explained to you earlier. Uh, the, the objective of this tool is to document trustworthiness of big data from multiple sources in cyberspace. Well, that's Avistero all over, right? Uh, if we're going to leave all that data in all those different places, then this is our problem in spades. So this uh, chapter is seeking to uh, develop automated methods for assuring what it calls the province of data flow. It's really fascinating. Um, it says that the province is the sequence of transformations in the data as it moves from one node to the next in the, in the entire flow. And effectively, the trustworthiness of the data is the emergent property of that whole flow. So somehow or another, you have to be able to assess that provenance. <clears throat> so what are the values here? Well, the values are trust and privacy. It's explicitly being built to enhance trust that we all have in big data over the internet. And without that, it, we could argue that big data can't exist. I mean, there, there's only so much that, that, that could happen if we couldn't trust. And, and the sociological point about trust here is that we cannot control everything that other people do. So we have to, in a sense, say, okay, Within the bounds of control, the rest is a matter of trust. It's that relationship thing again. And here we are expecting to trust people we've never met, never heard of, and the data that they're producing and that it's flowing toward us. How can we do that on a global scale? Well, the authors say, right now, we can't do it on a global scale without compromising the privacy of the individuals. So there's this trade-off in their view, and also, of course, their future <laughs> research program which is to attempt a completely automated uh, assessment of this. There's another chapter in here. I've never heard of this concept before, weaponized crowdsourcing. Have you all heard of this? It's, um, it's you know what crowdsourcing is, of course. It's using uh, people um, around the world to um, artificially uh, pump up uh, the reputation of a website or uh, some Twitter something or other uh, by paying people to click, click into it in a variety of ways. Even if they're not interested, you, you pay them, they go and they click, and so the, the popularity rating goes up. Uh, and this can be used in a variety of different uh, contexts. So the, the authors have developed a tool for automatically detecting both the execution of crowd turfing tasks and the identities of crowd turfing workers. So from my point of view, there are two issues here, two values here. One, of course, is the trust in the internet. We've talked a little bit about that. Uh, but in the, in the first instance, it was about the trust in the information as it flows through, through the network. In this instance, it has to do with the way that intentional uh, uh, falsification, if you will, of, uh, of uh, social media sites uh, use uh, is undermining trust in the content as a whole. But there's an interesting phenomenon that they report in this chapter, and that phenomenon is that some, but not all, crowd turfers come from developing countries. And so the issue that you ask yourself there is, these people are not well paid. And so the question becomes, how is weaponized crowdsurfing taking advantage, or, 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 or crowdsourcing in general, taking advantage of the, of the global inequity in labor and wage costs across the, the face of the globe? You could ask yourself social justice questions here, uh, because the people who do this are not well paid. They have none of the kinds of controls that we expect 
for labor, et cetera, and so forth. So there's an interesting side dimension to that that the technology itself can't really address, but is worth thinking about. Now here's uh, Sorin's work, as I'm sure all of you know. This is a very interesting uh, combination of sociology, communication theory, high technology. And the issue here, once again, is to improve uh, the effectiveness of collaborative work, but this time it's collaborative work mediated entirely by the computer. Computer-mediated collaboration, like is Wikipedia is probably the best example. Or wikis of any kind. Wikis in general. And, and Soren uh, borrows uh, from this uh, line of thinking on social entropy that has to do with the, the emergence and, and uh, decline of, of hierarchy in, in work groups. Uh, social entropy, if there's a high entropy, there's uh, very little uh, differentiation or inequality. As the entropy uh, goes down, as it gets more organized, then, then there's a, an emergence of hierarchy. And that somewhere in that balance between no, no hierarchy and, and a completely hierarchy, most online tasks find a sweet spot uh, where they get done more effectively. And so the question is, okay, are we gonna let that simply happen or are there ways and tools that we can use to find the right balance and more effectively move through a, coll a collaborative, uh, a, a computer-mediated collaborative task? And so here, <clears throat> the visible effort tool enables collaborative work groups to watch the extent to which they're uh, becoming more or less hierarchical and, and thus take action on their own to control that balance. And so that enhances the autonomy of the work group, and ultimately, if you find the right balance, it improves the effectiveness of the output. Is that roughly right? I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for getting my back there. But the key here is that this visible effort tool, the VE tool, has the effect of maximizing, of, of improving two values, autonomy of the work group and the effectiveness of the process, of the product, therefore, uh, the good that is done in this world. So my final case is a really fascinating case for me uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, early on, uh, I was asked to do some Twitter analysis in an ethnographic way. So I read six million tweets and I came up with a theory about um, uh, communicative stuff in tweets. Uh, and the, the sponsor looked at it and said, you're a, a lunatic. Nobody reads manually six million tweets and treats them as ethnographic data. I said, well, what do you want an anthropologist to do? Well, I was fascinated because at various times I brought that up to other people. Now, oh, this is way, way too hard. We can't do this. I was particularly interested in, in hashtags because I think hashtags have a very, very powerful role in Twitter in, in building community and being meta-communicative and a whole lot of stuff like that. And that one way of, of really keeping your pulse on things is to really track the hashtags. So in this one project I was working on, this uh, one big data cruncher said, oh, you know, this is just too hard. We can't do this. We can't possibly do this. The, the signal is too low. So I said, okay, well, you know what you're doing. You're, you're a big data cruncher, so you must know what you're doing. This guy did it. This, in something that he calls small phenomenon, small community phenomenon, he is able, that this study is able to track the micro changes in the Twitter universe about public infrastructure projects like building, a, like bike sharing projects or the placement of a new subway or things of that sort. And that's the point here. So the objective of this is to take the Twitter universe in a community, uh, the, the talk that people are, are doing about a particular infrastructure project, social media commentary, they call it ideas and people, so it's social network analysis and semantic analysis about public works projects, which they call infrastructure discussion networks, or IDNs. The idea is, is to visualize those in real time as they unfold. So you know essentially how the sentiments are changing over time. And if you're a public official attempting 
to be serious about incorporating community attitudes and community leaders into your infrastructure project, this becomes a real-time tool that you can use for this. Now, the, what's interesting to me about this tool is that in this instance, uh, in order to realize the value of effective community input, you had to design the tool to respond rapidly in real time. So there's a connection, deep connection there, at least to me, between the instrumental and the substantive value of the tool that, that, that is essentially set the performance requirements right there. So this tool then, uh, autonomy, community autonomy, individual autonomy, beneficence, a better public infrastructure for everybody, enables urban planners to dynamically monitor and incorporate public sentiment over the lifespan of a project in real time. Very exciting stuff. Small world phenomenon, he calls it, because it's very short-lived. He, he describes it in network terms as uh, very, very shallow, not very wide, very short-lived, uh, but potent. Small world phenomenon. So this ultimately then, uh, if, if we're in the value of democratic decision-making on large urban expenditures, this is a tool that can help with that. And, um, so we have both autonomy and, and beneficence uh, as values that can be realized here. Okay, so to close, what I'm trying to say here is that with the, the privacy matrix, this will help us explicitly identify, discuss, and reflect um, about the values that we are employing in our work. Um, I, I, at this point in my life, count myself as a big data developer, as strange as that might sound. Because I am using big data, I'm trying to figure out ways to use it for forced migration, HIV, et cetera. I'm working with engineers and computer scientists and all these kind of folks to do this. So I am a big, this is about me, not about somebody else. And I do believe, and this comes, this is right at the heart of what ethics is all about, in the broadest sense, that if that we need to make our values explicit and thus knowingly embed them into the tools that we make to manage big data. This is not something you do after the fact. This is something that happens as we're building the tools. And so the idea here is that the privacy matrix and this analysis of the principles, this rather formal analysis of the principle, it will help us articulate and then better use these values um, in our big data work. I want to thank both the National Science Foundation and NIH for supporting our work. And I want to thank you for listening. And I appreciate it. And any questions that you have, uh, I think we have another half an hour if you can tolerate it. Uh, if you need to go, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much. <laughs>